On today's show, we'll dive into our Locked On Rockets NBA Draft Big Board. Who should be the top prospects the Houston Rockets have their eyes on this draft cycle? We'll dive a little bit into the Scoot Henderson versus Brandon Miller debate, as well as should the Rockets trade or keep their pick if it does fall into that four to six range? All that and more coming right here at Locked On Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. The Houston Rockets select Jalen Green. Alperon Shingun and Jabari Smith Jr. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. Every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Hey, Houston fans, I am so happy. You're getting somebody who's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's going to come, come in and compete from day one. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin. The show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts, including YouTube. Be sure to search YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Today's comment. Go let me know in the YouTube comments, if the Rockets pick falls in that four to six range, would you like to see them hold on to that pick and make one of those selections or trade that pick for something else? Let me know in the YouTube comments. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked on Rockets part of your day every single day. If you're an everydayer, thank you. Whether it's on the way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym, thank you for making LOR part of your day every single day. Joining us now, I had to track him down. He was gone for a minute, but he is back. None other than Madison Moore. You can follow on Twitter at MadmanLeaks. Here to help us as we dive headfirst into a, a ton of draft covers that we're going to have for you here at Locked on Rockets in the weeks and months leading up to the NBA draft lottery and the NBA draft itself. There is so much draft discussion to be had and some exciting news here. We had to postpone it for a couple of weeks because Madison and I weren't able to connect, but I'm so happy to announce that he is one of our new weekly rotating co-hosts here at Locked on Rockets. Madison, so happy to finally have you back on the show, man. Yeah, man, it's, it's good to be back, man. I know we got kind of disconnected for a little bit, had some things going on, but we're back and we're ready to go, and it's draft season. It is draft season, man, and I think the best place for us to start here is even though there are a couple maybe de facto picks here at the top of the draft that are probably locked in, set in stone, everybody's going to be unanimous on the guys at the very top of the draft, we're going to go ahead and establish our Locked On Rockets big board here, you know, for at least we'll start with the top six guys on our respective boards and kind of navigate from there. We'll also... We'll get into a little bit of the debate, the discussion about Scoot Henderson versus Brandon Miller at number two overall, if that's where the Rockets pick should ultimately fall or whoever may land with that number two overall pick, right? Just kind of the merits of Scoot Henderson versus Brandon Miller as prospects in this year's draft cycle. And then also just kind of the worst case scenario outcome, right? I mean, if the Rockets pick falls somewhere in that four to six range, is it worth it to keep that pick when you look at some of those prospects or should the Rockets entertain the idea of trading that pick? We're going to get into all of these different topics today and then diving deeper into some uh, draft analysis again, you know, in the day, in the coming weeks and months, you know, deep dives on players and, you know, what the Rockets really want to try and accomplish with this draft, what they might be able to do with that Clippers pick a little bit further down the line. So, Madison, let's start here, and, and we can do this one of two ways. So I'm going to let you decide which direction we go here. We can either go back and forth and just start, you know, start at one. We both name our number one pick, start at two, name our number two, and go back and forth like that. Or we can just go one through six all in a row, like you go one through six, then I go one. How do you want to do it? Yeah, let's do back and forth. So if we have some discrepancies, we could talk about it. Okay, I like that. I like that. That's, that was the way that I was leaning, but I wanted to give you give you the chance to steer the bus for a minute. All right, so in that case, I feel like, unless you're going to come in here with a, a scorching hot take, I feel like we're going to be on the same page here at number one, Victor Wembanyama, right? Yeah, man, it, it has to be Vic. I mean, it'd be malpractice not to have Vic one. It, it would that's, be. That's it would be. 
<laughs> Bas- this is LeBron, bro. Ba- basketball malpractice to not have <laughs> Victor Wembanyama scoot or Victor Wembanyama n- not pick number one. I should say uh, we're gonna get into we, we've we've hyped up Victor so much. We're gonna do a deep dive on Victor very very soon here and what makes him such a special unique prospect and why you should be excited about the chances for the Rockets to get him at number one or, or overall. However small that fourteen percent chance is, but all right. So Victor number one. Glad we're on the same page there. Number two. Scoot Henderson. I'm, I'm firmly in the Scoot Henderson at number two camp. I, you know, I know there have been some draft heads who have had Brandon Miller over Scoot Henderson at number two. I just can't quite get there, and I know we're going to unpack a little bit more of that discussion here in segment two, but Madison, where are you at with pick number two? Yeah, it's, it's hands down Scoot Henderson, and I don't think it's close. Complete, utter tier above uh, Brandon Miller. So I, I think we're both seeing eye to eye on that. And I think most people... Um, in the draft world and the scout world, we'll, we'll see it the same way. Okay. All right. So we're, we're, we're in lockstep so far. Number mm-hmm. three might be the spot where we have a little bit. I, mean, I actually think we're probably going to be in lockstep on three as well. Brandon Miller for me at number three. And, and again, I've got, I've got Victor in a tier of his own. I've got Scoot in a tier of his own. And I've actually got Brandon Miller in a tier of his own. So those to me yeah. are very clearly one, two, three in a row. Are you the same way? Exact same way. Tier of his own. Tier of his own guy. Let's see. Locked on host together. There top we go. Three, okay. In, in unison. <laughs> in unison. We, right, lo- we, right. lo- we love to see it. We love to see it. All right. I, this is where I know we're probably going to get into some, some, some differences here, four through six. It might not happen right at four, but it's definitely probably going to happen. We're going to have some shakeups over these next three selections. At number four, I feel, and this is where I think you get all these guys who are kind of all in one tier together, right? Where you could hear arguments for some of these guys over other ones. And at this point, it's just kind of, you know, how you interpret prospects, what you're looking for, upside versus floor, all these different, you know, debates that we can get into. But right now at number four, I've got Amon Thompson. How about you, Madison? I do not. Have Ooh, Thompson. okay. All right. Here, here's where it gets, it gets dicey, and I, I probably uh, divulge from most of the draft community with this, but I have Jairus Walker, and it's because there is a complete, I feel like, an utter drop-off once you get to this point. You drop a lot of tears, and if you consider Amon Thompson's upside, right? Amon Thompson, I think, has one of the highest upside upsides in this draft, but I have to weigh that not just against uh, – I have to weigh that against his downside as well. And I think his stock is pretty volatile, and I think he has a pretty big glaring hole in his game with his shooting that, to me, I don't think will ever really improve that much. And I know we see guys improve shooting every day in the NBA, every day, right? Well, That's one of the things that we see NBA players do all the time. The issue I have with Amon Thompson's jumper is not just the form and the mechanics, which are rough, but it's the touch on the jump shot. And that is an area that we do not see improve every day at the NBA level. And although I think Amon can still be successful because he's a guy who has the ball in his hands, it severely limits the type of star he is, and it'll severely limit the type of versatility he brings to your team and your team building as well. I'm afraid that he may be Russell Westbrook, Ben Simmons-esque if he never uh, acquires a job. Yeah, one one of those kind of like where it's just a fatal flaw, right, in his game where it's just like everything else he does is so good, but he's got that one issue that kind of drags down all the other good stuff that he brings to the table. I hear that, and I think – some excellent points there, especially one other one, right? Is it's it's really hard to evaluate both the Thompson twins because of the competition that they're playing against in the overtime elite. Like it's it's I mean, they're playing against teenagers, right? Like it's really hard to tell like how they're actually going to translate to the NBA level right now. You can see the flashes, you can see the talent there. Um, but they might step into the NBA and you're like, oh wow. Like they they were not ready for this whatsoever. I think, I think they're projects, yeah. I think it's gonna be rough. I think they're a lot further behind than um than people understand i i watched them play uh uh i can't remember the name of the team but the team was g league level players and the tops and twins really struggled they struggled with ball pressure they struggled i mean it, it made me think their handles were a lot further than behind than what we think and honestly i mean they even have some finishing issues at times with the level of play that they're playing now once they become a play against real rim protectors I, I don't know, man, but hopefully they'll be better spacing because they don't have many shooters on their team. And so hopefully that helps them out. 
Coming up, we're getting it into our picks five and six on our Locked on Rockets big board, as well as some of the debate about Scoot Henderson versus Brandon Miller for the second overall pick in this year's NBA draft. We're going to get there in just one moment. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Nissan's most electric player of the week is brought to you by the all-new, all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria. And this week's most electric player, we're going to rewind the clock a little bit and go with Jalen Green because he did take a pretty big step forward in his sophomore season, averaging 22 points per contest. Every time Jalen Green steps on the court, you might be in store for an electric performance, right? The way that he learned to attack certain defenses and upped his scoring average and the way that he kind of just built out his game this past season, right? Established himself as as a better playmaker, really kind of added some duality to his game, right? Where he could score from the perimeter, but also getting better at attacking the interior, finishing through contact and getting to the free throw line was a big part of his development this past season. And for all those reasons, he is your most electric player of the week. If you need some more electricity in your life, you can check out the 2023 Nissan Aria that packs pin to your seat power and premium intelligence all in one EV, the all new, all electric 2023 Nissan Aria, the EV for people who love to drive shop now at NissanUSA.com. Today's episode is also sponsored by BetterHelp because look, getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process because we're constantly growing and changing as individuals, right? It'd be great if there was like just a guide on how to approach life, but unfortunately there's not. Therapy can help with that though because therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we want it or why we react to certain things the way that we do until we talk through those things with a professional. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA today to get 10% off your very first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Madison had Jarris Walker, number four. I had Amon Thompson, number four. So as we're diving into where we at or where we're at at, at number five on our respective boards, uh, I actually, that is where I do have Jarris Walker at number five on my board. And to your point, Madison, the whole upside versus floor argument, all that to me, Right, It should be about best player available at all times in the draft, and it's really hard because sometimes you fall into that trap of like, man, the, you, you start looking at a player, like their fit would be incredible on this team, or you like start hyping up like what a player could look like. And to me, I have to even like try to get away from my own biases in that regard and think, no, like if I'm looking at pure upside, which it, that's what it should be in the draft, right, is who has the best upside. To me, I think Amon Thompson has that borderline, whatever, future star potential. I think Jairus Walker can be incredibly good, though. Like, I see, when I watch Jairus Walker, I see, like, flashes of, like, a Bam out of bio kind of, like, defensive versatility with what he brings to the table. And especially now that we know the new head coach of the Rockets, Emi Odoka, is a guy who, in the past, has enjoyed running with some double big sets with uh, Al Horford, Rob Williams. I mean, could you imagine drafting Jairus Walker and having him in the front court alongside an Alper and Shingun? Like, again, some really good defensive versatility there, a complimentary big who gives you uh, you know, somebody who kind of gives you a different skill set to what Alper and Shingun provides. Exactly what Emi Odoka actually said in his introductory presser, right? Talking about wanting to bring in some different types of bigs to put, you know, alongside Alper and Shingun. Again, I, I don't read into that message whatsoever. It's like, oh, he wants to replace Shingun and he wants him gone. He wants different options at the big spot. And, and I read that as a guy who historically has used two bigs in his rotations. Somebody who wants the option of running double big with two very different stylistic bigs. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's been reports about the Celtics wanting Alperin Shingun in the draft, right? So there's, there's some optimism that he sees a particular way that you can play Shingun and the, the way he played Robert Williams next to Al Horford was as a roaming big free safety type big that can kind of clean up and uh, clean up a lot of mistakes uh, that the, that the defense, uh, makes right and that is where Jairus Walker thrives like Jairus Walker um he he's all, um he's also a great on-ball defender a very good versatile on-ball defender but hands down 
his best trait is off ball being a free safety in the passing lanes as help as a help defender. He's on time all the time and he's a sneaky good uh, shot blocker with a seven foot two wingspan. So I definitely think he fits next to Alper and Shingun as well as next to Jabari Smith Jr. And I also think he has some real good upside as a facilitating hub doing a lot of the stuff that Shingun does in the short roll off dribble handoffs. He's going to be a good screen setter. So he offers a lot of versatility as well along with uh, that offensively, along with the defensive back. And he, he fits that archetype for where, again, you're to have a, you know, a rim deterrent, a rim, you know, a, a shot blocking presence. That presence doesn't have to come from your, your five. I know that traditionally, mm-hmm. right, your five is looked at as, as viewed as your defensive anchor, the guy that's, you know, going to contest shots at the rim. It doesn't have to be. And there's a world where, again, you could run a Jairus Walker, Alper, and Shingun front court. Uh, maybe not even as your, maybe not as your starting front court. Maybe maybe you do it as your starting front court. But you could run those guys in tandem with one another at the four or five spot and get your kind of rim deterrent presence out of your four in that lineup. And then, again, Jabari is a guy who can very easily slot down at the three if necessary. But I, so I gave you my, my fifth guy on my board. That was Jairus Walker. Madison, where's you, where's the, who's the fifth guy on your board? It's actually a Sar Thompson. Okay. And for the, for some of the similar reasons you said, I'm, I'm in high upside. I mean, this guy has sky high upside. I think he can do a lot of this, uh, similar things that a Sar does, but also has the ability to play off ball. He has more touch on his jump shot. So I believe in that and him, uh, bringing his jump shot further along, and he has connective passing. I think he has he has a good handle, and I think he takes his time when he has the, the rock in his hands. And I think that serves players well at the NBA level. Level you notice that players play with pace, players play with change of speed and slow down um, at the NBA level. And I like that he plays a bit slower than Amin. Sometimes I think Amin gets too fast for his britches, tries to make. Too, he gets too cute with his moves, but he does see angles. Uh, Amon does see angles a bit differently. But I think we can teach Asar to do that. And, and, and more, most importantly, Asar, I believe that Asar can get to a 36% jump shot, right, long term. And then with all his physical tools, I think it'll be easier for him to be an effective winning player at the next level. And it's worth noting, right, I mean, the, the, the roles that they occupy for their overtime elite team, right, Amon's been tasked with being the primary creator, right? They, you know, put the ball in his hands, doing, you know, the the brunt of the playmaking. It's not that Asar isn't capable of that. He just hasn't been asked to do it to the same level that Amon has to this point. But to, to your point, right, the connective passes, the things that we have seen out of him, I do think kind of bode well for what his role could be in the future. And you're absolutely right on the money with the, the shot making ability, the touch that, you know, it, it is better, right? There's you, there's a bit more confidence that Asar can get that part of his game figured out, at least right now compared to his brother. All right, so we've got our top five. So that leads us to, well, we'll just do, we're just doing six today because it feels, it feels, you know, appropriate to do six since the Rockets pick can fall no lower than six. Although we may revisit this discussion and tackle some of the other names outside of our top six elsewhere floating around in the lottery as well. But six for me, Madison, Maybe this is where like I'm going a bit dark horse rogue, like off the beaten path here. I really like Cam Whitmore. I love really, Cam yeah. Whitmore, man. Like I, I just I see his game, and this is where again I have to I have to like try and squash my own biases a little bit. But I think about him like on the wing for the Rockets, and it's really exciting, right? And like I see I, the when I first started watching Cam Whitmore, I see like shades of like Corey Maggette a little bit out of Cam Whitmore. <laughs> I like that. And like, like I love, and I, dude, I'm telling you, I love Corey Maggette as a player. <laughs> like I, Corey Maggette's Clipper days were so like, he was such a good player for the Clippers. I, I just, that that's where I'm going, going with Cam Whitmore, number six on my board. What about your number six pick? Man, I, I really like that. Corey Maggette. I hadn't heard that or thought about that, but I definitely can see it. But for me, number six is where Amon comes in. Okay. And this is where, this is where the upside just. It's ridiculous. It's just too much upside for you to pass up. And I do admit that you know if you know if Amon never gets a jump shot, he still could be Russell Westbrook on the floor, or you know some level of Ben Simmons. He, Simmons, he could be that level of effective, right, with his defense and with all the other skills that he brings. Or even, a, or even like you know a bigger, a bigger, more explosive uh, Rajon Rondo, right? Like, like you know somebody who's right, gonna, right. you know that, doesn't have the shot but can still impact the game. Exactly. And I, I think that I think he can still be a very, very effective player in that. And then if the shot ever does come along, you know, because I could be completely wrong. Right. And if the shot ever he puts the work in, 
you know, you you get super upside. You can get one of the yeah. best players in the draft. So yeah, so that's where Almond comes. But I love that Cam Whitmore comp, man. That, that I like Cam a little bit lower, but yeah. Just it's just when you see like the explosiveness in his game, right? That's that's yeah. where it reminds me of like the ability because he doesn't ha- like. It's weird because he he beats his guys so effortlessly sometimes it feels like and has that that quick one two explosion to the rim and doesn't have like you know maybe not like a ton of bounce to his game but some good finishing right takes contact really well um has got a good like NBA ready body already and I just so much of how he attacks and how he creates his advantages reminds me of of old school Corey Maggette so that's where that's my comp there for for him uh, I will say, you know what, we're going to flip, we're going to flip the script a little bit here. Cause I wanted us to get into a little bit later on in, in segment three, the whole trade or keep, you know, pick four through six. But I feel like since we're already kind of talking about picks four through six right now, we might as well tackle this topic right here. So Madison, mm-hmm. I mean, for you, when you're looking at, at some of the names that are available there, four through six and knowing where this organization wants to be this next season, the steps that they want to take under Ime Odoka adding some veteran presences this off season, all of that, taking all this into account for me, still so many of these guys, four through six, right. Are going to be kind of project guys. I really don't think there's a single one of them that you really think can come in and be an immediate impact player right away. I think they're all, they've all got their warts to some degree. They're all going to take a little bit of time to get up to speed at the NBA level. And because of that, and because of all the mouths that the Rockets already have to feed on their roster, as far as young guys go, I still lean if they land four through six, as exciting as some of these names are, I think I'd probably still rather see them trade that pick and bring in, you know, utilize that pick to get an even better veteran, you know, piece to add to this core than grab the pick and like stash the guy or bring him off the bench for 15 to 20 minutes a night. Um, Cause again, they could rather than using that entire 60 million, right. They can trade for an established piece with one of these picks four through six and just absorb that player directly into their salary cap space rather than having to, fin- you know, send outgoing salary, whatever. So that's kind of where my head is at, but I could be persuaded. And so I want to know if you, if you, you know, believe differently at this point. I think the Rockets should shop it for sure. I mean, but it's important that you get good and equal value from it. And yeah, I they, think, they shouldn't oh, trade it just to trade it. Right? Yeah, like that's that's yeah. not the case. I, and, and and I say that, and of course, that's you know, that's well, duh. Yeah, you should get good value from it. But it's a lot hard. It's very hard to get equal value in that range of the draft for the four or six pick. It's not quite enough to get to land you a all star, right? Like it's not quite good enough to actually land you an all-star, but then it's, it's, I feel like you can get a starter. Enough. I feel like you get a starter. Though. Yeah, you can, you can definitely get a start. You can definitely get a starter, but then you pass up on the upside of the guys in that range mm-hmm. who could be higher than a starter. So it, it's a crooks. It's a balancing act, but I do think Oklahoma city um, is, is particularly interesting in that because Jairus Walker fits the need of that team so bad and they have the Rockets of future draft assets. So there's a lot of give and take that makes sense for those both teams to maybe be able to make get a deal done where you maybe get a, a role player and, and maybe one of the Rockets picks from the Westbrook trade back, right? Um, or, you know, maybe you could convince, maybe they're in love with Jairus Walker because he's such a good fit, right? And maybe you can convince them, you know, put KJ in or some other good players in to get a Jalen Williams, right, who may be a bit, right, maybe a bit expendable because they have so many playmaking ball handlers on that team. Now, I, I mean, that's a long shot, but that's the type of stuff that I would think get a young, good player that's proven that they're going to be, uh, that, that can help contribute right away. Yeah, rather than, and yeah, obviously Jalen Williams, just fresh off his rookie year, but he's an older rookie. He's a bit more yep. established. Clearly, you know, was really impactful this season. You know, uh, one of the runner-ups for rookie of the year. I mean, he, he very easily could have, you know, walked away with the award quite possibly if Paolo Bancaro hadn't been the the runaway favorite for the greater half of the first, you know, first chunk of the season. But knowing, you know, Rafael Stone's MO, right, he's constantly, uh, I've got this got this sound clip. It's worth playing. I would consider trading anything. Try and trade stuff for better stuff. That's I, I, lo- I love that sound bite, but that's exactly what the Rockets should be looking at with with that pick, regardless of of where it lands. Again, I think it's it's pretty safe. Picks one, two, three. They're walking away with Victor Scoot or Brandon Miller, and then it's that four to six range where things start to get a little murky. Maybe there's some flexibility, some optionality there. All those all those different buzzwords, but. 
Coming up, we're going to get into the debate about Scoot Henderson versus Brandon Miller at pick number two, not just for the Rockets, but just kind of draft talk in general and why that even became a debate in the recent, you know, weeks, you know, Passing, passing us by some of the draft experts, draft heads out there arguing Brandon Miller over Scoot Henderson number two. We're going to get there in just one moment. But first, today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits just right the first time around. Just add your ride to the My Garage section of the website and look for the green check to know that the part will fit or your money back guaranteed. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Madison, as we've been kind of unpacking some of our, our preliminary early draft assessments, going through the top six big board, all that, one of the sticking points for this draft cycle, one of the discussions, debates that kind of popped up a little bit close to the end of the regular season there was this idea that Brandon Miller might actually go over Scoot Henderson in this year's draft at, at pick number two. And famously, right, Kevin O'Connor with the ringer, a few other draft experts, draft heads started making the argument, making the case and laying the groundwork for why Brandon Miller could go or should go number two overall over Scoot Henderson. And for me, I, I, it, it never really sat quite right with me. It almost feels like this is like this year's version of like the edgy, like hot take, like, okay, this is, we got to have some kind of angle that everybody else doesn't have. Right. So we can be unique or different and really like market our draft boards or market our shows or content, whatever. And, for me, when I look at these prospects, right, you mentioned it earlier when talking about Wimby, right, best prospect we've seen since LeBron, truly generational, right? That word gets thrown around way too often, and I think it does apply to Wimby, but the word choice that I would use when you're looking at a prospect like Scoot Henderson, who is incredibly talented in his own right, is franchise altering, right? Somebody who's going to more than likely change the direction of a franchise for the better pretty much single-handedly, right, by himself, and... So I, again, you call Wimby generational, you call Scoot franchise altering. I don't quite see Brandon Miller in that same tier as a franchise altering type talent. I think his top end is still incredibly high. I think he's going to be probably more than likely an all-star caliber player at the NBA level. He's got all the tools to do so, to be an, you know, an incredible two-way wing with some creation ability, shooting, playmaking, all of that at the NBA level. It, that should be a top end caliber player. I just don't know if I see his true top end being, again, a franchise-altering talent. Mm -hmm. And that's why, for me at least, it is kind of no debate at pick number two. If the Rockets are at pick number two and they somehow don't take Scoot Anderson, they better be trading down and getting, like, a haul to do so. If they were to outright just, like, pick Brandon Miller at number two, I'm going to go to Toyota Center and start burning stuff down left and right. Yeah, I'm 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 with you, man. I mean, the, there is levels to this. And when we talk about this... I don't believe this is when we say Scoot Henderson is a different tier of prospect than Brandon Miller. We that doesn't mean Brandon Miller doesn't have a chance to be better than Scoot. I mean, we're not fortune tellers, right? But what it, what we're talking about is that Scoot Henderson, I, we believe, has a higher chance to reach his higher end up outcomes, right? And that's due to a couple reasons. And one of the primary reasons is the way Scoot Henderson is built. It's not normal. This is not this. These type of prospects don't come every day. I mean, he's literally built like a tank with a six foot nine wingspan. OK, and he has elite athleticism for his size and position. OK. His body type is more similar to Donovan Mitchell. If you needed a, a, a player archetype, right? Six foot two and Donovan Mitchell, I believe, has a six foot ten wingspan and that, you know, he does not have size problems in the NBA guarding up and down the lineup, right? And so I don't see those issues for Scoot Henderson. He's not undersized at all. In actuality, I think he's um, big for the for the position. And then when you add in the elite athleticism and change of pace, 
which we know is so important for success in at this level that he his change of manipulation at his age is truly special. Um, when you combine that with the way he gathers the ball and processes the game, this is a truly high IQ, high level processor of the game, almost Chris Paul esque. So now we. I'm, have... I'm glad. You, I'm glad you say Chris Paul esque because, like, hey, you know, you see, you see Scoot, and you immediately you see the explosiveness, the athleticism, all that, and yes. you want to comp him to like guys like a Derrick Rose or a yes. Russ or a or a or a you know Jung uh, Jung wow a young John Wall <laughs> and you know it, I think those are those are reasonable comps to make but I don't think I think it's almost a disservice to Scoot because he has such an incredible feel for the game in addition to that right which is why you know guys like you know a Russ right clearly Russ has some of his shortcomings still an elite playmaker still a, you know a future first ballot hall of famer all that but there are some shortcomings to Russ's game, right? The IQ, the decision-making at times, the sloppy play. I think that Scoot is going to be like almost this weird, perfect marriage of a guy yes. like Chris Paul and then also a guy like a Russ or a Derrick Rose with that elite, exactly. innate athleticism and explosiveness. And we haven't, I don't think we've ever seen a guy like we've that. We've never seen it. So when you talk about generational, I mean, honestly, to me, this, this guy fits the bill to be because I have not seen a player with the marriage of those physical tools with that high level processing. Right. And when you combine those two, you give, you get something that we've yet to actually see in the NBA. And I, I don't think people understand how rare that is. This like is the, clo the, the closest we get is kind of jaw. Right. I think, but, but even jaw doesn't have the he body. Doesn't, that he doesn't have does, the body. Right? He so, doesn't have the body. Or, yeah. And I mean, he doesn't have the body. And I think, he has, to me, Scoot has more control over what he's doing. It, you know what I mean? Like, I can't, you, you say the control and it immediately makes me think of the picture of, of Josh <laughs> sideways in the air yeah, trying to so, go over LeBron. And, and that stuff lends to more injuries. Like sometimes Josh, like Josh, like it, it makes for some incredible plays, but also it makes them for some really volatile, dangerous situations. And I just think he plays with so much more body control and he has a much solider frame. And and I, I just have not seen this before. That, that man, really that man just ta he takes off like he's getting shot out of a cannon. I swear, or he's you know on one of those tra trampoline like bounce, you know the the uh, the sonic boom like the dunkers or whatever at halftime. Like I swear, you're right. The, the the lack of control is concerning, right? And that was look that was an issue for even Derrick Rose, right? As Derrick Rose's mm -hmm. knees took you know a lot of damage because he didn't know how to land properly, right? Mm -hmm. Being able to not only utilize your athleticism your explosiveness but also knowing how to harness it and control it is a big part of the longevity of some of these players right even you're looking at zion right who's struggling with the fact that yes he's this insanely explosive athlete but his body is just not able to deal with the wear and tear right it's breaking down from underneath him because he just he goes up and he's just putting down all that weight after every weight. single landing like it's just too much man yeah, man, and, and I think that's the rare part. I think the way he is built is kind of kind of makes me feel more comfortable for his archetype. The way he uses his athleticism makes me feel more comfortable for the longevity of of him as a prospect. And 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 when you combine the marriage of that processing dog, I, I'm com I'm completely bought in. This is what the Rockets need. He is a legit engine for a team you know what I mean a legit engine the leadership when it comes out to check out about his leadership who he is as a person how he approaches the game the seriousness about it I mean this guy checks almost every box and to me I think this guy would go number one in the last three four drafts I think he's the same level of prospect as Anthony Davis and Zion Williamson I I, I honestly do and like if you told me you needed a point guard in you know the Zion Williamson draft I think you would have selected him over. You you would be justified in selecting him over Zion Williamson. I was about to say so, so. You so you would so you would take him over. So you if take, I needed a point guard. So if you needed a point, well, so you so you would take him over. You would take him over Ben Caro. Yes. You would yes. take him over Cade. Yes. You yes. would take him over who was before Cade? Was that the Ant draft? That was Ant, right? That was Zion. Huh? Oh no, no, no it might have been Ant. Z Z Zion. Been. Yeah, it was it was Ant, and then it was Zion. Was twenty nineteen. Okay. Yeah. So yes, over Ant. Yes, Ant had a lot of questions coming out. He was my number one pick in that draft because it was a weaker draft. 
Uh, but he had a lot of questions coming out. Um, I, he, he definitely yeah. would have went over him. Yeah, I, th- I think I can get. By- I think I can get behind that. And I think that's that's where when you're looking at it, it's so tough, right? When you're when you're if you're Scoot Henderson, you're like, man, the year you declare for the draft, you've also got to go up against a guy like Victor Wembanyama, and you're like, yeah. he, you know, he has every right to be the number one pick or to be a mm-hmm. number one pick, but he just he just so happens to line up with the first time we've ever seen a seven four you know French kid who can do the things that he does on the basketball court, and it's just unfortunate timing for for scoot henderson but it could also be very again b- very beneficial to the houston rockets if they yes. you know, find themselves in that number two spot again they they need an engine and that's the other part you know you mentioned that and all the boxes he checks it's so fortuitous po- possibly fortuitous right that both the best player available is also the best fit available i mm-hmm. i could maybe even argue that scoot is a better fit for this rockets team than wimby based yes. on their needs and some of the boxes that need to be checked this off season. That's why there's a part of me, man. And I've, I've been hesitant to say this and you know what? I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to stake my, I'm going to stake my it. reputation on it. Say it. <laughs> just, just give me the number two pick, man. I don't even care about number one. Just give me the number two pick. I believe in scoot that much. Like I'm not going to be upset if they miss out on Wimby. I will be equally as happy if they get scoot Henderson. And again, it's one of those where it's like, if you're number one, you have to take Wimby and there are, there are, there is, his, history tells us big men over seven foot two have a problem staying healthy. It's a fact. Go through all of NBA history. Every single big who has been over seven foot two has struggled to remain healthy at the NBA level. And Wimby was on record saying he's not a five, right? He's like, I don't want to play the five. I want to play, come in and play the four, that whole thing. So maybe he's not going to even be, a, maybe he'll just be, you know, a Dirk, Nowit- Dirk Nowitzki with defense, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. However you want to comp him. But there's part of me that's a little worried about about Wimby, right, and his longevity, and and I don't want another Greg Oden, KD situation where you had number one and you felt that you had to go one direction with with that number one pick, and then you let number two slip away, and Scoot Henderson goes to another team, you know, Spurs or Charlotte, Orlando, where whoever gets him, and then you're sitting there and you're like, man, we what could have been, right? I don't want to be the what could have been team. I want just give me Scoot Henderson, and I will be elated and that's kind of where i'm at madison i'm i'm exactly where you are I, i've been saying this i've been rooting for the number two pick and it's it's because i believe in the longevity of scoot henderson like i can see scoot henderson having a 13 14 year career and putting the rockets in a position to compete for 10 plus years you know what i mean like at a very high level and with wimby he's such a rare prospect you're really going to have to have a plan of low manage for, management for him for day one. His team even talks about how many – he gets 12 hours of sleep. He moved, uh, One of the reasons he moved to this team was not only the freedom of exploring the rest of his game, but to also um, – to also play two games a week it's it's good for you know what i mean to, to protect does, himself right to yeah, protect right. him yes right so he doesn't have to put as much uh on his body an 82 game gauntlet is tough it's tough for a guy like that especially if he's gonna be taking one legged floater threes you know what i mean like that stuff isn't good for your ankles man you can come down on somebody you know it's a lot of things he has some really tough ugly falls you know he's long, he's kind of awkward and lanky you know when he moves and it just it scares me it, it does it just scares me it's but, okay i'm i'm right there with you man and look yeah. look we, we didn't mean to we kind of derailed the the scoot yeah, versus brandon miller thing and we wound up talking more scoot versus scoot Wimby. Versus- but it, 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 it's worth it right this is these are some of the different draft mm-hmm. angles and there's there's a lot of things to consider in this draft cycle right mm-hmm. i mean First off, we don't even know where the Rockets pick is going to be. Things are going to become a lot clearer once we know where that pick ultimately falls with the draft lottery coming up right around the corner. May 16th, we've got, we are a few weeks away from finding out where the Rockets will pick, but we're going to be exploring all the different draft prospects, some of the different angles to consider with the Rockets leading up to the lottery, all that good stuff. But because the lottery has not happened yet, we should at least run a tankathon spin, don't you think, Madison? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's run that tank oh, oh, for the number two. Oh, we're both we're both just gonna say number two. Or are we are we, we vibing? Have to, not, All right. After, after that spiel, we got to. <laughs> Here we go. All right. And because technology be damned, we we're not able to have it on the screen, but we're just gonna have to go based off my reaction to what I do over here. And oh, well, you know what? It's not number two, but it's the only thing better than number two. I'll take a number one. I'll take hey, a number one go. pick. Hey, man, look, let's my go. 
My luck here running the Tankathon spin has been awful on LOR, so I will take a number one pick. Pray for Victor. The Pray for Victor worked out despite all of our like anti-Victor propaganda that we just spilled out there. We'll still take Victor number one. On that note, Madison, you know the drill. Let everybody know where they can track you down at. Yeah, come uh, find me on Twitter at, at MadmanLeaks. Come interact with me. Talk to me. Love to talk rock. That's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts. That's Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, free and available on all podcast platforms. We're also available on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let us know your thoughts on the trading pick four through six, whether you'd want to keep the pick, trade the pick. Give us your thoughts. Give us your big board in the comments section. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.